heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, a conversation with ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood. From the banking crisis to crypto and beyond, we'll discuss it all. And we'll take a look at the health of startups amid the crisis. We're joined by the CEO of Pilot, the tech startup accountant doing the books of Silicon Valley. And we'll get the outlook for the gaming industry this year. Unity CEO John Riccatello joining us for an exclusive conversation on his findings. All that and so much more coming up. Let's dig into these market moves. Relief, is it? Anxiety dialing back on a financial crisis, on a banking crisis. But what then for the Federal Reserve? We see money tentatively going into the Nasdaq up six tenths of a percent, actually not performing as well as we saw in Europe. Really, the risk sentiment improving up 1.3 percent. The stock 600 on the higher side. Money moving out of bonds. Yields push higher. Are we anticipating actually that with the banking crisis in some way being alleviated by regulatory moves, does that mean the Fed can still hike 17 basis points up on the two year yield? Or is this just an improvement in risk sentiment. Moving on, what's happening in the world of crypto? In fact, Bitcoin taking a breather. Well, what about the likes of the other crypto coins? I'm looking at the Ether at the moment. ETH currently up basically one percentage point on the day. We're seeing actually movement in some of the other directions of cryptocurrency today, Ed. Yeah, news headlines driving individual movers. Meta up six tenths of a percent. Morgan Stanley's Brian Novak saying this is the most durable mega cap tech stock, citing those cost cutting efforts. Also seeing Alphabet, parent of Google, markedly higher. Bards, the generative AI tool being rolled out to the public as of Tuesday morning in a slow and safe way. Also, want to look at Tesla, one of the best performers out there this morning. Moody's became the second credit ratings agency on Monday night to give an investment grade rating. That's supporting the stock along with the kind of risk on mentality we're seeing there across the tech sector. Let's quickly look at First Republic bouncing off a record low as of Monday night. Bloomberg reporting that JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon coming up with a plan to bolster First Republic. Those shares up 40 percent. Our conversation, Caro, with Kathy Wood coming up in just a few moments time. But first, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Shanali Basak for the latest of what's happening with the banking crisis and also this kind of improving risk, uh, risk sentiment out there in the market, Shanali. Yeah, we have to talk about a few things here, Ed, because you have First Republic shares certainly up on the day as you have the U.S. considering measures that could backstop depositors as well as the banking leaders of this country getting together and thinking about what they could do to stave the pain. But I don't want the, to discuss count the volatility not in just that stock but what it has done to the capital markets without SVB and the markets there to support the community of innovators and entrepreneurs with a lot of this uncertainty about lending in the regional banks you have seen the capital markets largely freezing up both in terms of equity and debt in a big way now with that said not all is bad in the markets we live in this very upside down world where you have a bank like First Republic being downgraded now with a credit rating that is frankly looking at an opposite trajectory of a firm like Tesla, whereas Tesla's Moody's rating is more than you see over at the junk rating over there at First Republic. So what does this mean at the end of the day for how people value companies? I want to pull up some innovators here. Before you talk to Kathy Wood, for example, while you have the regional banking system under so much pressure, you have some of her top wagers here really feeling some love. A top banking executive last week pointed out to me that Robinhood, for example, was worth more than Credit Suisse. That was true last week. It is certainly true today. It is up on the year. You also have Coinbase that is mm. feeling the love of Bitcoin coming back to life. That Bitcoin price hitting and reaching and staying above 28 thousand and so serious movement here that we're seeing on the year the question is how sustainable is it when this risk appetite in the markets is so heavily clamped up we'll be very excited to see what you guys have to say uh, certainly as we anticipate Kathy Wood as we anticipate the Federal Reserve as well Jay Powell's going to take the stage tomorrow what is it all meaning perhaps in the world of private markets as well because we are really focused on that from a tech community thinking about yeah. VC investments and startups. I'm glad you asked that because we're sitting in this moment where we're watching a lot of those private capital providers parse these loans particularly when it comes to Silicon Valley Bank. They don't love it. There's only so much that they could take on, which shows you that in the last era where the rules were a little lighter for certain of these banks, 
the private capital can't step in fully. Remember, a lot of those crossover funds are also feeling a lot of pain, and the capital raising environment has also clamped up. So a lot of uncertainties and unanswered question, but the money tomorrow will certainly be less than the money of last year. We keep a close eye on just really what the public markets mean for private market valuations and indeed sentiment across the risk spectrum, whether it be here in the United States, whether it be in Europe as well. We thank Shanali Basak. We, of course, are going to be getting now to a key conversation with Cathy Wood. And at that moment, we do welcome in our TV as well as our radio audiences worldwide for the conversation with the ARK Invest CEO and CIO, Cathy Wood. We've been discussing, of course, bank failures, Cathy. We've been talking about a confidence crisis. And you have said that Fed policy, Jay Powell was the primary culprit, the pace really of rate hikes from such a low base. But for you, is the risk of a systemic credit event still key? Has that been avoided? Well, I think uh, they're addressing the liquidity issue, but not really the solvency issue uh, from our point of view. Um, a couple of things have happened here that have never happened really in history, and so the banks didn't expect it. Uh, the first was interest rates up 19-fold in less than a year. Never happened. Under Volcker, which it was two-fold, 10 to 20 percent. And the low base does matter. Many people dismissed it saying, oh, just such a low base. No, expectations were low base. Mm. So that was the first. And we've never seen that magnitude of uh, an earthquake, I would say. Then um, the second thing that no one expected, again, because it hasn't happened in such a long time, was deposits leaving the system. For Silicon Valley Bank, it was venture capital, uh, facing a, a funding drought, and so they had to draw down their deposits. Uh, but then for others, you've got money market funds attracting, paying much higher than deposits, uh, attracting flows. So that combination yes. was, was lethal. Uh, and so now they have the backstop in. Now what do we have? Uh, we have the, um, they're going to be paying up if, they, if they're depending on the facility, They'll pay roughly 4.37% right now is that rate, OI, OIS plus 10. And, um, and that's much higher than many of them have, have been paying for deposits, number one. While in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, their average held to maturity security on the asset side of their balance sheet was only 1.6. So they're going to see net interest losses. Uh, now, instead yes. of having marked market hit equity, uh, the, these losses are going to hit earnings. Kathy, that's the cause. Let's go to the effect. Since the collapse of Silicon Valley yes. Bank, the market has changed its Fed expectations for a less hawkish or a more mm -hmm. dovish Fed. You cite the Fed as the cause. How nimble are ARC being? How much are you recalculating your view going forward? Well, uh, as we said before COVID, uh, as we were descending into that, and we are saying now, innovation solves problems. And you showed a few charts uh, at the beginning that suggest that uh, some of the innovators out there are solving problems. I mean, I think the most dramatic example of it to us was the behavior of Bitcoin uh, last week. It absolutely took off. It was a flight to safety uh, vehicle. Uh, and so uh, it is really proof of concept that innovation solves problems. There are in, in Bitcoin, fully decentralized, tr fully transparent, auditable, uh, which is uh, uh, addressing all of the banking's problems right now. And so a flight to safety, a little bit of an insurance policy. There's no central point of failure in Bitcoin. Caroline, uh, ARK has 20, 30 calls on Bitcoin. The most bullish case around 1.5 million on Bitcoin. The most bearish around 250,000 on Bitcoin. Somewhere in the middle, you have around 682,200. That is the sort of base case there. Interesting at a time when no one is making that kind of long-term projection. Yeah, and Kathy, we know you're a long-term investor with long-term calls. But what on earth gets us to that bull case of almost one and a half million dollars per Bitcoin if a bank crisis doesn't? Uh, oh, uh, well, 
uh, one of the things that happens in a crisis is a liquidity dries up. So that that uh, tends to hurt assets. And the fact that Bitcoin uh, moved uh, in a very different way from the equity markets in particular uh, was quite instructive. Uh, you'll find the, the building blocks of those price targets in our Big Ideas 2023. So ARC Big Ideas 2023. And they are, for the base case, uh, I would suggest quite conservative. Um, we've dialed some of them down since last year. I know that corporate treasuries uh, pulled away from Bitcoin because because the uh, regulators were pulling them away from uh, from Bitcoin on their balance sheet. So we've pulled back there. Uh, but we do believe that the behavior of the price through this crisis is going to attract more uh, institutions, for example. Uh, we've done a, a report targeting institutional investors and and an alloc the allocation that uh, they should make if they if they care about this new asset class diversifying their portfolios. And uh, I believe it's somewhere between two and a half and six and a half percent. Mm. Uh, so not crazy. These are the sorts of allocations they would have made to emerging new categories of assets like real estate in the 70s, emerging markets uh, in and small cap in the 80s and 90s. And Kathy, I mean, Ed, let's discuss some of the ways that Kathy and Ark have invested and got exposure to crypto. Of course, there's the companies such as Coinbase, yeah. but there's also GBTC, the Grayscale, Bitcoin Trust, and regulation is in the eye of the storm there as well, Ed. I mean, talk us through what the SEC seems to be pushing us towards. Yeah, and Kathy made an interesting point there, right, about institutional investors. Kathy, if I remember correctly, back in 2021, a big part of your thesis on the run-up in Bitcoin was that more U.S. corporates would add it to their balance sheet in, case, in place of cash. That doesn't appear to have happened to the level that you'd hoped. Is that because the U.S. is just not of a regulatory friendly environment for this to happen? Yes. Uh, you know, in the beginning of the crisis, it seemed like regulators wanted to blame crypto instead of the significant rise in interest rates and the deposit outflows. Uh, now we're seeing it uh, as a solution to the problem, but the regulators are still uh, are, are still reticent. Something interesting happened today, or maybe it was yesterday. Uh, Governor DeSantis uh, basically said that uh, he was going to uh, allow, uh, uh, allow, I don't know if he said this exactly, but it, the conclusion of his saying, we're going to set Florida apart from the rest of the nation, uh, was this ability to touch companies that touch crypto. Uh, after all, these are cash deposits. They're fiat deposits. They're not crypto. And this can be done on a state-by-state -state basis. So I think you'll see Florida, uh, like it has done in many other ways, distinguish itself from the rest of the pack. <clears throat> Kathy, Katie Greifeld, my good friend and, and a, a just terrific reporter on the ETF Beats, has been talking about grayscale and the opening arguments in the case with the SEC. Um, in that discussion, how much are you considering adding to your position around trust? How are you reading how that grayscale situation is playing out? Uh, so it seems as though uh, the judge is having some trouble understanding how the SEC could approve a Bitcoin futures ETF, which is swaps based and therefore has counterparty risk, um, but will not allow a spot Bitcoin ETF. It really makes no sense. So they'll either have to basically shut down the, the Bitcoin futures ETF, it seems to me, or allow uh, a Bitcoin ETF. So I think Grayscale is doing Bitcoin a great service and uh, its arguments have been very sound. We asked our audience, Kathy, what they make of the behavior in Bitcoin. This was what they had to say in the terms of how the asset class behaves. Uh, is it a must have in a banking crisis? Few Respondent said, yes, no, it's too volatile was the main response. Caroline, interested in your take on that. What this all comes down to 
is how we're playing the interest rate environment right, how we're reading the Fed, how we're reading across different asset classes. Yeah, and to that point, Cathy, you have said just earlier in the conversation, the rate of change of the Fed, the 19-fold increase in interest rates that have so upended, you say, in many ways, what's happening in the financial markets and financial conditions. But mm. we did see signaling from the Fed. They did tell us they were going to be hiking rates and hiking rate fast. Why then didn't you move your portfolio around more? Well, uh, the, the premise of the question is that we're an asset allocator. We are not. Uh, we invest exclusively in disruptive innovation, nothing else. What we did do was we concentrated our flagship strategy, so ARKK and, and our other strategies, ARKQ, ARKW, ARKF, and uh, we moved in the flagship's case from 58 names in February of 21, when we peaked, uh, down to 27, 28 names. Uh, we have a scoring system, and uh, the scoring system is based on variables we believe are very important to innovation. Uh, and so we concentrated the portfolio. Many mm. people uh, in the traditional asset management world, when they go through a risk-off period, they will diversify their portfolios uh, by moving closer to their benchmarks. What they're doing is typically selling our kinds of names. Yeah. And uh, so we that is why they're putting extreme pressure on them. Uh, we'll create losses by selling stocks, and that gives us a tax loss asset, which we have. It's over $2 billion right now against which we can take future gains and then concentrate towards our highest conviction names. We have a paper on our site which shows the benefits of this concentration strategy during risk off and diversification strategy during risk on. But of course, when it's risk off, you've underperformed and actually even on a five year basis. I know people will say, look, you're already looking in a long period, five year outlook kind of perspective, but look back from here over the last five years. And yes, it's been a turbulent time. It's been an interest rate hike time, but you've underperformed the S&P 500. What do you say to those that have a shorter time frame in terms of investing, those that are looking to retire in the next five to 10 years? Should they be with you or do we have to be long term equity investors that have a much longer runway to get have exposure to ARK investments? So we're the closest thing to a venture a, a strategy to a venture capital fund in the public equity markets. And uh, a venture fund has a long term investment horizon. If uh, an investor cannot have that long term an investment horizon, uh, then they should allocate perhaps a small amount to our strategy, say one or 2%, uh, which by the way, mo from what we can tell, uh, most advisors have us at that one to 3% range. Now, uh, why would you put any if the risk was the volatility that you see on this chart? It is because our companies are going to disrupt the traditional world order. And if we're right, then the large cap benchmarks right. and even some of the mid, caps, uh, 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 mid cap funds are going to be disrupted. We will be a hedge. Now, uh, you'll, I will say and submit to you that last year was the most unusual year of my investment career. And not only mine, but bond investors. So bond investors had the worst year in uh, yes. in, in uh, 200 and some odd years. Uh, when interest rates go up 19 fold in less than a year, uh, it's going to kill long duration assets. Bonds are long duration assets. Uh, they've never seen a year like that. ARC is a long duration asset. Uh, but if we're right and these companies are going to disrupt the traditional world order, uh, then we want to be on the right side of change and the market will come our way away from those benchmarks, which represent the traditional world order to our strategies. For our global TV and radio audience, we're speaking with Kathy Wood, CEO of ARC Investment Management. Kathy, in June on stage at Up Summit, you cited retail inventory levels and you told me to if you remember that inflation would unravel did you get that one wrong 
No, if you look at if you look at upstream what's going on, commodity prices are coming down quite dramatically, some by 70, 80 percent. Uh, and I would also say the, the retail call was very right. I think I think you'll agree on that. Uh, the discounting, we think is going to continue to work its way through the system from the commodity price level uh, to downstream near the consumer. And you can see this, Tesla is cutting prices. Many people say, oh, it's because of competition. No, it's because their commodity prices are coming down. Uh, and and Elon's even talking about deflation and their, the, the, the cost associated with innovation is coming down because it follows a learning curve. So I think the innovation that our companies uh, is de uh, are delivering uh, right. are going to be one part of the deflation, commodity prices another. And I will also tell you, the yield curve, it last, the week before last, was down, uh, in inverted by as much more than 100 basis points. That also is a deflationary signal, as is what's now going on in the banking system. Yes. I think the banking system is fearing deflation. Well, Kathy, to that note, we've been talking about sort of a de facto tightening of financial conditions in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank. You moved last year to give investors exposure to venture funds, private firms, in that partnership with Titan. Has that proved to be bad timing? How impacted has that been from SVB? And we've only got a couple of minutes left. Sure. Uh, well, we're fledgling still. It, it takes a long time. We have, as you say, with uh, Titan, a social distribution stra strategy. We have other wrappers as well. I much prefer to start a strategy during tough times. And actually, now we can be a solution uh, if we get inflows, people looking for venture, for they can get into our venture fund for only $500. So, uh, again, the democratization of investing uh, and this idea public uh, closest to a venture capital fund in the public markets to be able to actually do a venture fund at a time that the venture community needs us. Uh, if you look at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, that situation has robbed a lot of venture capitalists of, of funding. Has it and robbed the, the U.S. of innovation, Kathy? do you think? It's, uh, I would say that regulations threaten to do that, and certainly in the crypto space, absolutely. But I also think the seizing up is not just a U.S. phenomenon. Uh, it looks like it's more of a global phenomenon, judging what uh, has just happened in Europe. So it's not as much that. It is regulation, uh, the likes of which we're seeing around okay. blockchain technology, that okay. threaten U.S.'s position in innovation. Kathy, very quickly, did you have any exposure to SVB? None whatsoever. Uh, well, okay. I'll say, as our business, okay. no, and our company's very limited okay. exposure. I was so surprised okay. I just and wanted to, clarify. to see how little. Oh, that yes. I just wanted did to clarify that for our audience, Kathy. I'm sorry to jump in, but we got to go. Kathy Wood, CEO of Ark Invest, we're really grateful for your time here across Bloomberg Television and Radio. Thank you. Now, coming up, we stick with the crypto discussion as Circle picks France for its new European headquarters. All of that next. This is Bloomberg. Time for a quick Wall Street beat, where we take a deep dive into the world of Wall Street and global Wall Street. And today, Caroline, Circle choosing France as its new European headquarters. It's interesting in that conversation with Kathy Wood, the same ideas that the US might not be the most friendly regulatory environment if you're trying to foster innovation or a change in the system. Yeah, really interesting. Almost like a comp competition to Wall Street, shall we say, in this particular beat. Yeah. But What's interesting with Circle was its exposure to Silicon Valley Bank, was the fact that we got a DPEG of its key stablecoin, USDC, yes. for a moment because of that sort of connection of decentralized finance to centralized finance in that moment. But notable that really London's trying to be the place, UK trying to be the place for European regulatory space for crypto, but France seems to be winning out. They already wooed the likes of Binance right. previously. 
I remember five years ago when Circle's main function was to move money between borders before the crypto pivot. Anyway, coming up, what kinds of cybersecurity risks does generative AI pose exactly? Well, we're going to talk about all of that and the security landscape at large with Wendy Whitmore, SVP for Unit 42 of Palo Alto Networks. All of that coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco, where it is 9.30 a.m., but over in London, 4.30 p.m., where European markets are closing. Continue momentum in the equity space. Stock 600 Europe up 1.4%. And continuing to see the euro strengthen against the dollar. We're at 108-ish, the highest level for the euro against the dollar since the first week of February. Like in the United States, as Caroline was talking about earlier, the action is at the short end of the curve when it comes to the bond market, specifically in euro-denominated bonds. You look at the German two-year up by around 23 basis points as we kind of pull out of the more kind of haven assets, or at least at the short end of the curve, the more policy-sensitive end, that's where the action's at. More muted in gilt. You look at the UK two-year yield, okay, a little higher, but 3.27%. We're still kind of passing over the fallout from not necessarily what's happening with Credit Suisse and UBS, but the backstop being provided by central banks and liquidity situation, but also what the ECB is going to do going forward, Caroline. All of that, of course, having repercussions for risk sentiment across technology. But let's get back to some innovation in and of itself. Let's talk open AI, of course. Well, actually, it temporarily shut down its popular chat GPT service. Just yesterday, Ed, it was in the morning after receiving reports of a bug that allowed some users to see the titles of other users' chat histories. A spokesperson told Bloomberg, actually, that the bug is an unnamed open source software caused that problem. And OpenAI is still investigating the precise cause. But right. notable. <laughs> when something like this happens, you go to Reddit and you go to Twitter and there's so many people that took screen grabs and were like, I've never asked oh, ChatGPT that. You know, some of the images out there are astonishing. But it shows, like, with all the euphoria comes risk mm. that if the system breaks down, the user base is so big now. And in many ways, we've seen big companies, regulated companies, banks in particular, not wanting this sort of third-party software, not letting people use ChatGPT right. when they're in the workplace because they're worried about vulnerabilities. Let's dig into that in this world of innovation and what it means in terms of cyber risks. Wendy Whitmore is with us, Senior Vice President for Unit 42 over at Palo Alto Networks. Of course, your bread and butter is thinking about security, but particularly you're looking at vulnerabilities when it comes to outsources of your workflow, the supply chain into your company. You just been putting out some key reports, Wendy. What are the key findings at the moment? Yeah, thanks, Caroline. I think it really ties into the story that you're talking about here, right, in terms of technology being disruptive. And that can be used for good. It can also be used for bad. Uh, and so I think our report really tells a story uh, that we live every day, which is that banks, financial institutions, organizations, schools, cities throughout the world, they're all being targeted in particular by ransomware actors. And what we show is that these cyber criminals are becoming even more effective at doing their job. Uh, they do a great job of understanding what's in an environment and which data that they can steal. Uh, and stealing is a, a very important concept here because what we're not seeing is just a traditional ransomware attack where an organization's data is encrypted, but we're seeing much like nation state actors have done for years, we're seeing data being stolen and exfiltrated from environments and used for extortion. And attackers are doing that on a daily basis. They're not just threatening right. it. But we're actually seeing uh, four times uh, every four hours, we're seeing more uh, wow. organization data being posted. Ed, with regularity and the stakes, well, becoming evidently more high. Yeah, and there's a point that I wanted to make on ChatGPT. Wendy, which is that it impacted ChatGPT and also the, the, the premium tier, GPT+. Plus. While you could see the search titles of other users, you could not actually get into the conversation. So, so I want to be clear, you couldn't actually kind of access data relevant to other users, but it, it was basically deemed as a bug in the open source software. My question to you in the context mm -hmm. of cybersecurity is, are they, is this kind of issue an afterthought as people try to rush these products out? They don't think about kind of the base security of the software that they're writing. 
you know, so I think that software vulnerabilities across the board are challenging for every organization to deal with, and they're uh, only going to become more of a problem just due to the scale that AI brings to the table, right? So we're going to continue to see these type of vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, I think one thing that's exciting is that, uh, you know, last week, uh, was released a national cybersecurity strategy. And in that, we talk about, in particular, the need to protect, uh, expand the definition of critical infrastructure, So, and the role that technology vendors and providers play in that, right? So we see that with these supply chain attacks becomes a major issue, but we're also seeing a lot more rapid information sharing that is becoming incredibly positive. I'm reading over the, the, the results or your findings in this research. And Caroline, what's so interesting to me yeah. is the types of businesses found most vulnerable are those businesses we entrust with our data on a daily basis. And I suppose also when we're thinking of keeping our own company protected, I don't know about you, done countless training exercises about right. knowing phishing, but smishing is a new one, Wendy, that you've been talking a lot about. What are the ways in which companies can protect themselves? Yeah, so, you know, we talk so much about AI, right, and all the technology investments, but I think, Caroline, what you're getting at are the human side of that. I think one of the most compelling findings for us is that we've seen uh, these attacks increase to now 20% of attacks that we deal with uh, include a harassment element. And I would imagine that if we talk again in two months, we're going to see that number probably double. And what I mean by that is attackers are specifically going after uh, security, so executives, their uh, families, reaching out to them personally, their uh, staffs, finding any way that they can to socially engineer data out of them. And that's going to become a continued, incredibly compelling. And they're also getting super savvy about uh, understanding how businesses work, right? So understanding that if I target not only your organization, maybe has a great security barrier and perimeter, but you have business process outsourcers and outsourcers that also have access to your most sensitive data. And there are employees in those environments that I can target equally effectively that have access to your environment. So we're going to continue to see that type of activity directed towards employees across the board. And so how are companies protecting and assessing the vulnerabilities of their own supply chain? Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest keys is the mindset shift. And we are seeing so many organizations do that and actually win. So I think there's really a positive uh, outlook here. And our report tells that story, too, which is that so many organizations are effectively defending against these attacks because they identify them early. They practice their response. They understand that uh, these attacks are going to come. It's simply part of hosting a business on the Internet today. Um, and they've got great relationships across the board, not only with experts, but also law enforcement who can really rapidly provide them answers, often in the form of decryptors that can, um, you know, render these attacks ineffective. It is fascinating, Ed, when you're reading these sorts of data reports, is basically what the people, the attackers are trying to set out to do here. Right. And that's why our audience in particular should care, because they're going after finance. Yes, they're going after data and telecommunications. And the last one, which we have to discuss, Wendy, is cryptocurrency. Why are they targeting these specific areas? Is it just for financial gain? Well, any avenue they have that makes it easier to move money is certainly going to be a target, right? So the more that we can work uh, related to sharing information between public and private partnerships and stopping the ability of moving movement of cryptocurrency, for example, of disrupting attacker infrastructure, the more that we can do that, the more effective we are going to be against these attacks. And I think we are in a better place now in terms of that information sharing and being able to do it in a way that starts disrupting attacker infrastructure uh, and really starting to stop some of these attacks. All right, Wendy Whitmore, Senior Vice President for Unit 42 at Palo Alto Networks. Thank you so much. Just a headline crossing the Bloomberg on Credit Suisse. They have decided to suspend some bonuses for Credit Suisse staff. That coming from the Swiss themselves. We'll continue to track that story as a number of, I'm sure, technology industry bankers and others impacted by that decision. We'll bring you the latest reporting. Now, another story, a rare move. Google has suspended PDD's main Chinese shopping app, Pindodo, from its Play Store. After discovering malware in unsanctioned versions of the software, the action could cast a cloud over the company at a time when U.S. lawmakers have accused Chinese-owned apps like TikTok of potentially threatening national security. 
not really impacting ADRs. Shares of PDD up around half a percentage point. Yeah. Now, coming up, we're also going to talk about the impact of the SVB fallout on startups with Racine Tahir, CEO of the startup focused accounting firm Pilot. That's next, Caroline. And, and I mean, you were just talking about Pinduoduo. Let's just stick on China for a moment because we're watching shares of Tencent, the gaming and social media giant, seeing, well, remember, $160 billion rally since October. The next leg. Well, it's going to hinge on the crucial earnings release that's coming this week. Much of Tencent's rally has been driven by the anticipation, future sales streams, and of course the belief that Beijing will keep its promise of supporting the private sector. I have more on the company's earnings when they report tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. We continue to track the fallout from SVB's collapse. What does it mean for the future of early and growth stage companies which relied on the bank to fill the gap left by bigger players less inclined to take on that kind of risk? In a not out today, our Bloomberg intelligence team says liquidity contagion from lack of access to credit for startups and VC-backed companies is, quote, undeniable and the SVB spot will be hard to fill. That research from Deet Shigera at BI. Now, Wasim Daha is the founder and CEO of Pilot, an accounting firm for startups and small businesses, which specializes in CFO services, bookkeeping, tax prep, etc. Joins me on set in San Francisco. A lot of people didn't understand come Monday morning of this week how SVB played out in real terms for running a business. What was the experience of your customer base? Well, it was very panicked, I can tell you that. And it was panicked on two fronts. One was, of course, for our customers that banked with SVB, which was about half of our customers. They were concerned about the safety of their deposits. But the second order thing that I think many people have not anticipated is the impact this had on our clients being able to make payroll. Right. Because if you didn't bank with SVB, but your payroll processor did, you had a problem. Sunday night, Monday morning, probably more importantly, I had so many phone calls and text messages from VC saying the ADP wire went through, the ADP wire went through. They had access to SVB, but it didn't really mean anything. They were trying to make payroll. Where do you come in in that process as, an, as basically an accountant? Sure. So our phone and email inboxes were ringing off the hook the entirety of the weekend, Thursday, Friday, all the way through Sunday night, to say, hey, what do I need to do here? What funds am I actually going to be able to access? Which ones am I not going to be able to access? Do I have to file a claim with the FD, FDIC? How do I actually make payroll? Can I transfer funds out of a personal account so I can pay my employees? There was just a lot of panic, a lot of uncertainty about tactically, how do I make sure my employees get paid? You know, Caroline, in, in the last week or so, what's, what's been put in perspective, for me at least, is we talk about startups, mm. tech, in kind of abstract terms. They're businesses run by people with responsibilities. You know, that's really come out in the conversations we've had. They are, and that was going to be the collateral damage if a rescue of SVB didn't come in for the depositors. we well, seem the after effects of SVB are that the counterparty risks were so large because they banked the same types of clients. You are a founder dependent on the same types of clients. Pilot is servicing tech startups. Did you suddenly think, oh, goodness, I need to device, diversify my own business? I mean, one of the things we always think about, the mission of Pilot has always been not to do accounting for technology companies, though it's where we specialize. It's to help every small business owner out with this problem. So we're always thinking about how do we make sure our own customer base is robust against these types of shocks. OK, so you haven't suddenly thought, I need to broaden, I need to make my marketing perhaps more of a just early small company, SME, rather than a VC-focused, backed sort of a company? I would say not urgently. I mean, this is always something we're talking about. But we have a number of startup customers who continue to grow and thrive, and we're excited to continue to serve them. Have you won business because of what's happened? Are there any founders that basically said, I can't do this? I need your help. I think probably what we did do is do a good job of helping people navigate the crisis. Now, I'd say unlike another provider, if you had another bank, for example, Probably lots of new bank accounts were opened as a consequence of all the SUV excitement. It is not the case that lots of new pilot customers showed up at the door, though I think folks appreciated 
that we kind of were a, a nice hand holding guide throughout the process. And we'll see. A lot of people have said, look, it isn't actually that easy to go around diversifying who you bank with. People want minimums. People want an ability to show the lack of risk in your business model. And that's why SVB was so important to the tech system. What are you now seeing? Are people still with ease changing banks? Are they able to diversify to ensure their treasury management is where they want it to be? Well, I think a lot of people are now willing to incur a lot more pain here than they were previously, yeah. which is before all of the SVB excitement, I think no one thought too hard about, is my bank safe? Is my bank secure? And now I think the prevailing sentiment is that folks who were, might have otherwise taken a more laid back approach here have become effectively financial preppers. Like they care deeply about making sure, oh, I was shocked by the fact that this was not available for a few days. I now need to make sure this never happens again. I see. Great to have your insights. Thank you, Wasim Dahar, founder and CEO of Pilot. Meanwhile, coming up, we'll take a look at the gaming space, why shifting economic headwinds aren't actually slowing down the pace of game development. Our exclusive interview coming up with Unity Software CEO, John Riccatello. Ed, you're looking at certain particular companies? Yeah, First Republic. Look, we're up 42 percent. But remember, we closed at a record low Monday. What's driving this in part is a Bloomberg News report that Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan are looking at further ways to stabilize first, right? One idea, according to sources, that they take the deposits injection or the backing from those banks and make it a direct capital injection. But either way, the stock up 42 percent. But remember, closed at a record low this Monday. So much more to talk about next. This is Bloomberg. Microsoft tentatively defeated a bid by video gamers to block its planned $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard. A judge tossed the case without prejudice last night, calling it woefully short on detail. Let's talk about what that means and also the future of this acquisition as it sits in the gaming industry with John Riccatello, CEO of Unity Software, a software solutions provider for games running on mobile phones, tablets, PCs, consoles and, of course, AR and VR, in, in the first instance, your reaction to, to this Microsoft Activision deal, for you, how does it change the landscape? Well, for us, it really doesn't change anything. I mean, Microsoft obviously is the maker of one of the leading consoles, the, the Xbox, and Activision is one of the largest you know, producers of game content. Um, you know, this is, the game industry has really been an industry of Pac-Man forever. Um, companies like Activision and Electronic Arts and Take-Two have been acquiring, Sony and Microsoft have been acquiring, and then on the heels of all that, what we always see is new startups coming out of nowhere creating amazing things. So, um, you know, this has been an industry of serial acquisition for decades. I don't expect it to stop. Microsoft and Xbox is one console platform. Some news over the weekend. I hope we can bring it up on the screen, Caroline. I've made the jump and I've bought a PlayStation 5, having played on Google Stadia for the last 18 months. And of course, Caroline, Google <laughs> shut down that platform. So there you go. That's the big news in the industry. Sure. What do you make of that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're meant to be agnostic, Ed, but I mean, it, it does seem that you're, I know you're a key gamer. And, and John, to that point at the moment, you have been thinking about the ways in which you can continue to develop. I'm sure you're agnostic. You're going across every single platform. Just talk to us about whether the hype around AR, VR, the worry about people in this economic environment, perhaps not making a big splurge like Ed, particularly on a Quest, for example. Is that making you rethink <laughs> about your platform building? Well, I mean, let's, let's be realistic. The, the largest platform in the world today for gaming is mobile. Yeah. Um, that would be Android and iOS. There is north of 4 billion players there. Consoles are also super important, and some of the world's best content is made for consoles and also for the PC. And these, while they're much smaller in terms of users, in aggregate, probably a couple hundred million users, they're also super important. And for someone like me that's been in the game industry for a couple of decades, you know, I love them all. So um, you have to support them all, unlike Ed, um, I don't pick winners or favorites. Well, I don't pick winners or favorites either. I, I was playing Stadia. That was shut down by, by Google in my past. Right now, mobile, right, is where everyone's playing. What I find so interesting 
is you have Netflix trying to move into mobile games. Mm -hmm. You have a Apple in the App Store. You have the Google Play Store. All of them are also trying to track privacy policy changes, mm -hmm. advertising. What's that doing in the gaming space right now? Well, look, the advertising market um, it was definitely affected by the privacy changes that Apple implemented a couple of years ago. And then it also got hit to a degree by the economy. So starting last summer, um, buyers on the advertising side, the demand side, um, brought their spend down um, in anticipation of the the recession-like environment we're in right now, and that continues to today. It's it's a little depressed, but it but it's been stable now. I would say since the middle of last summer, so it continues to be a robust market. A little depressed from the peaks of uh, COVID or immediately post-COVID. You have a large advertising arm. You yourself had to make some tough decisions for Unity, for the amount of employees you have amid these economic environment that we currently see. Just push us towards the hype cycle that we find ourselves when it comes to generative AI. Does that end up meaning that people look to still invest in your area in that way of producing content, generative AI? Mm -hmm. Is that a help or a hindrance in this environment? Well, so first off, um, let me just sort of bound this a little bit with some data. So we're at an all-time high today for the engagement that players have on a global scale. So north of $4 billion, um, as I mentioned a moment ago. And it's even higher than it was in COVID era when people were, were you know, living and working and studying at home. So the industry is very, very resilient. Yeah. Um, it's actually kind of shocking that it's done that well. Um, now, of course, everyone's got this, this notion of a um, sort of a, a, a recessionary environment. But... The point I would make right now is the industry really moves on innovation, and one of the most important right. innovations in gaming is AI. Wow. Ending on gaming, Cara. What a show it's been from Kathy Wood to cybersecurity to gaming. An incredible start to the week. Wonderful conversation. We need to see CEO there, John Riccatello. That does it from this edition of Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg.